Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Ashu, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to share my thoughts on what's happening in Sri Lanka at the moment, and my very best wishes to the Saxena Center. I thought I would begin by outlining to you certain, what I think are the certain key characteristics of the Sri Lankan polity, and try to fast forward it to what is going on now. As you know, Sri Lanka is in deep crisis, and I would characterize this crisis as a crisis of governance, a crisis of governance which has a political dimension as well as an economic one. And the argument is probably best encapsulated in the demand of the Aragale, the people's movement, the struggle that we needed regime change in order to facilitate systemic change. Yeah. Now, in 1948, Sri Lanka got independence from the British. Independence basically passed to the Brown Sahib class. They were drawn from all ethnicities. They were neighbors in Colombo. They went to the same schools. They went to the same universities in Britain and came back and conducted their politics as if they were in the Oxford Debating Society. However, one of the first things that that government did was to disenfranchise by citizenship acts the largest single minority in that country. We called them Indian Tamils. I don't know why, but because all of us are Indian in some way or the other. We called them Indian Tamils. Basically, they were the descendants of the people that the British brought down to work on the tea plantations. And they numbered a considerable amount, and they were suspected of having leftist tendencies. And so the United National Party, the UNP, that formed the first government in Sri Lanka, very, very pro-Western, got caught up in the paradigm of Cold War politics and believed that having such a large minority with such leftist tendencies would be a great threat, and they passed the Citizenship Acts, which disenfranchised those people. They subsequently were given citizenship in Sri Lanka. There was a small proportion of them who were neither Indian citizens or Sri Lankan citizens. In the end, the Sri Lankan government agreed to give them citizenship as well. But basically, they live in conditions not very dissimilar to what their ancestors did. They live in what we call line rooms. They have asked for a 1,000 rupees a day to pluck that tea. But very few of them actually do get it, because like non-tariff barriers in trade, the estate companies find all sorts of ways of saying that, look, no, you haven't really qualified to get that amount paid. So we started off, therefore, by excluding a large section of our population. However, the United National Party, it's the UNP in common lingo in Sri Lanka, is also known as the Uncle Nephew Party. <laughs> and that will give you an indication of the extent to which our politics is largely dynastic and family-oriented. We have the Seninaikas, the Jayawatnas, the Vikramasinghas, the current president, Jayawatna who introduced the executive presidency, and then we had the Bandarnaikas, Mrs. Bandarnaika, her husband, who was assassinated, that was she was a widow of Mr. Bandar Naika, and then the daughter, Chandrika Bandar Naika Kumarathunga. And then we have the latest new entrant, and that is the Rajpaksa family. So we had Mahindra Rajpaksa as president, Gotabe Rajpaksa, his younger brother, as president as well, plus another 20 to 30 members of the family who were put in key positions of power and authority. Now, the big divide in Sri Lankan politics has been arguably at one level between left and right on the economy. The UNP was seen as the pro-capitalist party. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party was seen as the party of the people and came in with social democratic or socialist ideas. But there is another bigger divide, and that is that irrespective of their ideological differences on the economic side, 
they were both majoritarian in outlook, very, very strongly majoritarian in outlook. And what happened as a consequence was that the initial implicit understanding with the colonial authorities that Sri Lanka was an island that the, or in which the polity was to be based upon the notion of unity and diversity broke down, basically, because 75% of the population was singular Buddhist. And it's important to note that the identity, the majority identity, is singular Buddhist as opposed to singular or Buddhist. 75% of them are. And so, in 1956, we really have the dawn of a two-party functioning democracy. Mr. Estabdua de Bandaranaika, who came from a low country aristocratic family, educated in Oxford, etc., came forward as the leader of the people, as it were. He was the leader of five forces, the trade unionists, the farmers, the teachers, the, doc the local doctors, and uh, I've forgotten what the fifth one was. Anyway, it was called a five-power alliance that swept to power, and it swept to power on one single issue, language. Singular only. Singular only was the cry. And he swept to power on that basis. And as a consequence, the country changed irretrievably, quite frankly. Because, yes, English was the dominant language, but spoken only by very, very few people as a consequence of the way that the British government divide and rule or whatever, the Tamils, after the Burgers, who were partly Western, were given key positions in the civil service, etc. But once Sinhala only came in, and they were forced to learn Sinhala, large numbers left. So that was the first wave of the Tamil diaspora in the 1950s. They were educated people, there was an absolute premium on education in the North because it is not as fertile as in the South where you say you drop a seed anywhere and it'll grow. Uh, it was an absolute disaster. Because what it meant also was that in education, for example, you were supposed to learn in your mother tongue. And your mother tongue was either singular or Tamil. So school children from either of those ethnicities never shared a class unless they shared a period in English. Likewise, in university. And we still suffer from that because we have a cadre of university lecturers, etc., who have been literally frogs in a well. They, some of them have gone out to do their master's courses abroad. The vast majority of them are still stuck in Singular and Tamil. And the textbooks in Singular and Tamil, of course, are not up to date. They're at least 20 years old. Yeah. So you got this majoritarianism. But I could try to bring in legislation talking about the reasonable use of the Tamil language, etc. But the Buddhist priests, who, was, who were one of the uh, five in the Five Power Coalition, the Buddhist priests demonstrated outside of his residence. When he signed the pact called the Bandhanaika Chalvadaika Pact with the leader of the Tamils, and he was forced to literally tear it up in their presence. But another thing happened as well. The United National Party opposition staged a major march from Colombo to Kandy, where the Temple of the Tooth is, against the Bandhanaika Chalvadaika Pact. And as a consequence of that, in Sri Lankan politics, whenever a party has been in government and tried to deal with the ethnic conflict or the national conflict, as you call it, the opposing party has opposed tooth and nail. And when they get into power and try to do something, the same thing happens. So we've never, ever had any sort of common ground, if you like, to resolve that issue of majoritarianism. The second characteristic that I want to make, just one point again with regard to that structure of power, 
is that we don't often talk about it in Sri Lanka, but I heard it mentioned yesterday. We have a caste system, and it's a very strange caste system because it's a caste system that's shared by both the Tamils and the Sinhalese. Our caste system is not a pyramid. It is an inverted pyramid. The majority of the higher caste, the Valalas amongst the Tamils and the Goigamas amongst the Sinhalese, claim to be the majority in each community. They claim to be the majority in each community. All leaders of Sri Lanka have been of that caste, except for one person, that's Ranasinga Premadasa, who came up from the urban, urban uh, setting of Colombo, and he managed to squeak through by the tiniest of majorities, and of course he was killed by the LTTE. Now his son is trying to capture power through a new party, the SJV. Every challenge to the established political order has also been from one single other caste, and that is the Karava caste, as far as the Sinhalese are concerned, or the Karaya caste, as far as the Tamils are concerned. Prabhakan was from the Karaya caste. Vijay Veera, Rohana Vijay Veera, the leader of the insurgency in 1971, in 88-89, was also from the Karaya caste. So there is that division as well. Within the Goegama caste amongst Sinhalese, of course, sorry, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Within that caste of Marx the Sinhalese, of course, there are, there are variations, and the Rajapaksas are seen as of lesser stock, as it were, than the Bandanaikas and the Sennaikas who, who ruled the country. Now, as a consequence of all of this, and what happened in 1956, was that the state became even more of the major player in the economy. The nationalization sparked off what I think I would call at the end of the day, basically institutionalized a culture of entitlement amongst the people. Hence, we have an overbloated public service. Every election, 10,000 more people are going to be in the public service, and 10,000 rupees more is going to be given to those who are in the public service. So we have state-owned enterprises that are running at millions of losses. But the people, a normal Sri Lankan citizen, born gets free education, free medical services, gets a job in the public service, and dies there with a pension and EPF and ETF and all sorts of other benefits. So we are close to, well, we are in Greece with the danger of turning into a Lebanon as a consequence. Yeah. So that culture has got to be changed. But how is it going to be changed is the question. We've had major attempts at constitutional reform. We succeeded in 1972, uh, whereby the Mrs. Bandanaikis government came back and said, look, this constitution that we had was something given to us by the colonial powers. We have to turn ourselves into a republic. And they did two things. One was institutionalize the notion that Sri Lanka is to be a unitary state. No power sharing. Number two, they made singular the official language of the country, singular. And number three, they said that Buddhism, the religion of the majority community, would have the foremost place. So we stopped short of saying that we were going to be a theocracy, but we said Buddhism would have the foremost place. And those three formed the sort of pillars which the Tamils in particular resisted, and we got the 30-year ethnic conflict. But the problem with the Sinhala majority is that it's not only the authoritarianism and the corruption that goes with it, but it's also a fear. We say, there's a cliche, we say we have a majority community with a minority complex. And a minority community with a majority complex. <laughs> and as a consequence of that, after the defeat of the LTT, which of course was defeated amidst all sorts of allegations of war crimes and crimes against humanity, we turned against the Muslim community. The Muslim community is the only trilingual community in the country. 
truly trilingual community in the country. And it's interesting, the attacks on the Muslim community were largely on their business interests, their factories, their shops, rather than the killing of people, whereas with the Tamils, it was horrendous carnage, both in Colombo and in the North and East. We even went to the extent during the COVID pandemic where there was no medical evidence, international or national, and said that they cannot bury their dead. They had to cremate. It was only because the issue was brought up in Geneva and the Prime Minister of Pakistan at that time, Imran Khan, came and offered support to Sri Lanka that the government changed its mind. You know, but that is a very, still very, very strong axis of discrimination against the minorities. It's still very, very strong. And, you know, although the government wants to get the money from the Tamil diaspora, they, <laughs> they still have to come to terms with accepting a notion of power sharing. And the power sharing argument that the Tamils have always had and had it since before independence was, look, give us federalism. We are a part of this country, but we also want to be a part from, a part of and a part from. We want to be able to balance the notions of autonomy with the idea of interdependence. And that is something that's hanging fire. Just two minutes on the Argale, and that is that all of this has pent up as frustration and burst out into the open because the Rajapaksas have been the heirs to all of these shortcomings and mistakes. But they have taken it to a fine art. Art is probably not the right word, but nevertheless, <laughs> they have been known for rampant corruption. Rampant corruption, impunity, both with regard to war crimes as well as with regard to corruption, financial corruption. And they have, in effect, robbed Sri Lanka's public service of any sense of shame. And I think that's quite horrendous because, at one level, maybe our societies are more based on shame rather than on guilt. But we don't have shame anymore, as far as public service is concerned. One thing that the Aragalia has focused on is all the constitutional reforms and all of that, but they haven't really come out and talked about the answer to the national question. And as a consequence, people in the North and East did participate in it, but not as proactively as they did in the rest of the country. And they sort of said, look, all the problems in the South are facing in terms of shortages, etc., we faced for 30 years. And the rest of the country was relatively unperturbed by it. They ran cars on kerosene oil. That was the only option that they had. So we therefore faced this problem of reconciling the country, bringing it together on the basis of getting rid of corruption against impunity, but against impunity also for the questions of war crimes and crimes against humanity, which are now being discussed in Geneva uh, after a series of UN resolutions on Sri Lanka. So we are now at a crossroads. We are the oldest democracy in South Asia, but as to whether we are going to last like that is a big question. There are the arguments that come back and say, look, yeah, forget about human rights. We have to, you know, we can't have a revolution of the type we are talking about without breaking eggs, as it were. And therefore, we need to get the economy right before we can get anything else right. But I think there is a sufficiently large democratic tradition in the country which will not accept that. Thank you.